Hi, hello, and welcome to this regional dialogue. And before we get started, let me do a little housekeeping. Just let me share for those of you who are on Zoom, this event is both in English and Russian, and you can choose language settings at the bottom. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome, uh, but you can only listen to us in English. So let's get started. In many conferences and 10 years ago, we talked about how to feed the world in 2050, thinking that the growth of mouths to feed would be the major challenge. Today, the conversation has changed, become much more complex. We have become acutely aware, and not just in fora like this, of the multi-sectoral aspects of our food system and how it needs to be transformed. We're not just talking about coming to grips with hunger. We're talking equally worriedly about obesity. We're not just talking about food. We're talking about nourishment, the quality of what we eat. We're talking about inclusiveness and leaving no one behind, neither on the side of the farmers nor on the consumer side. We're just talking about increased production and we are talking about deforestation free and ecologically balanced agri-food systems. We've become aware of the twin challenges, climate crisis and loss of biodiversity, as much as of the promises of trends as diverse as digitization and plant-based meat or fish from the field. Our challenges have changed, the conversation has changed, and some pathways for the planet and people are already out there to be shared. And you, ladies and gentlemen, and your laptops out there in the region of Europe and Central Asia have been part of this conversation. You're driving it, you're identifying the five action tracks in the priority list to be brought to the table today, and therefore also in the run-up to the Rome pre-conference of the big UN Food Systems Summit in New York, in September this year. Whether you are part of the issue-based coalition or a government, business, farmers representative, welcome to our regional dialogue. My name is Connie Schimmer and I have the honor to moderate this two and a half hour event, which of course is part of the bigger conversation we are all engaged in. You've seen the program as interactive and as multi-topical as possible in such a short time. So I'm just going to mention that you can feed your questions and statement into the chat and we're trying to answer some of them on the panels. But first and foremost, I would like to introduce your host today. Welcome Vladimir Rachmanin, our regional representative for Europe and Central Asia. Uh, thank you, Connie. Dear colleagues and friends, it's an honor to welcome you all to today's event, which should contribute to the preparation of UN Food Systems Summit. Today's dialogue is facilitated jointly by UN agencies in the region who committed themselves to the promotion of sustainable food systems in Europe and Central Asia. These agencies are UN Economic Commission in Europe, UNICEF, WHO, World Food Program, International Fund for Agricultural Development, UNDP, World Meteorological Organization, and of course, FAO. I greatly appreciate the support and presence today of FAO Director General, Dr. Chiu Dun Yu. I'm happy to welcome our good friends and partners, Dmitry Mariasin from UNSC and Martin Frick, Deputy of UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Food System Summit. I would also like to acknowledge the Minister of Agriculture of Uzbekistan, Jamshit Abduhakimovich Hadjaev, Chair of FAO Regional Conference for Europe, and express our gratitude for his tireless efforts in promoting sustainable food systems in Europe and Central Asia. And of course, really warm welcome and thank for all our panelists and participants from all areas of our societies. Despite the fact that the hunger is not a major issue in the countries of our region, in order to reach sustainable development goals, we need to intensify efforts to lift the triple burden of malnutrition, namely undernourishment, micronutrient nutrient deficiencies, and overnutrition such as overweight and obesity. This burden remains the problem in the region, and not only in low and middle income countries, 
but also in the developed ones. We need sustainable food systems in order to guarantee better agricultural production, better rural life, better nutrition, and better environment for all. And we need an action. In Europe and Central Asia, we can lead on those issues and we need to do it. In conclusion of my brief remarks, let me congratulate many of you in our region for the energy and leadership being demonstrated also at the country level. Currently, we have 29 conveners nominated to lead national dialogues on food systems summit in the countries of the region and in European Union as a whole. Over 180 independent dialogues are being held in the region. I am truly inspired by these numbers, which demonstrate your interest to be a part of UN Food Systems Summit and to contribute to making it a real people's summit. Back to you, Connie, and thank you also for guiding us through today's dialogue. Thank you so much, Vladimir, and uh, hope to see you towards the end of our session. And uh, with that, we can get started with the opening. And we have uh, such high ranking personalities. It's absolutely fantastic. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, FAO's regional office in Budapest is uh, hosting the Secretariat of the Issue Based Alliance in conjunction with seven other UN agencies. And you are all the driving uh, the topics towards finding sustainable solutions in the food systems complex. I'm very happy to roll out the red carpet for FAO's Director General for probably the past almost two years in Rome. So we are looking forward to your opening remarks. Meet Dong Yu Chi, our Director General. Okay, uh, thank you, Connie. And uh, dear colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has exacerbated a situation that was already there. 690 million people in 2019 that are well, chronically undernourished. 3 billion people that cannot afford health house deaths and unsafe food supplies affecting one in, uh, in 10 people. The 2021 global report on food crisis showed that the, the steady increase in the acute food insecurity reached 155 million people in 2020. The pandemic also ex exposed the fragility of current agricultural agri-food systems and highlighted the need to transform them quanti quantitatively and diversified. Agri-food systems are the world largest economic system with over 4 billion people being employed in there or indirectly engaged with that. A holistic redesign of the world agri-food system is crucial to ending hunger by 2030 and achieving the other SDGs. We need to jointly address how agri-food systems can be transformed to sustainably deliver and the quality diets needed for the good health, relieving pressure on the planet, natural resources, and driving increased economic growth. Agri-food systems should be fair and equitable and ensure decent employment to all those engaged in the food production, food processing, for the marketing, trading, delivery, and supply, all the three chains, uh, production, value chain, and the supply chains. Today's panel discussion will provide a valuable opportunity to identify solutions to transform our agri-food systems. I encourage all of you to uh, have a very good, uh, uh, solid suggestion to your relevant key players in this region. We need more consensus in Europe and the Central Asia region. I look forward to your opinions on how to strengthen collaboration, promote the circular economy, maximize use of digital tools, foster innovation, 
adapt the financial support. Dear colleagues, the region of European Central Asia is an economic and a cultural powerhouse. Contouring diverse cultural, agro food systems, and climate zones. This diversity gives the opportunity to share experience and good practice within the region and beyond. But I should point out that during the past 30 years in this region, the bigger challenge are lack of investment and innovation. And with concrete action. To incorporate the various priorities in our new strategic framework, FAO, and a, tra a transparent, inclusive consultation process was followed during the past two years. FAO new strategic framework for the next decade supported the 2030 agenda to achieve, to achieve the uh, transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and the sustainable agri-food systems. I know that in this region, you, you quantitatively, you have enough, but you have very much limited number of the uh, food diversity compared to other regions. And also you still have a lot of challenge how to produce more with less impact on environment, less input. And then you can improve the efficiency for the farmers, for the consumers as well. So you can really uh, improve the uh, uh, agricultural food system as an economic system, not as a, 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 a only public goods, yeah? The UN Food System Summit is a timely opportunity to galvanize momentum, foster the dialogues, and present game changing solutions if we have enough and a strong political commitment in this region. We need a solution that are evidence-based and backed by the science. And also we need to build up the uh, coherent alias across different key partners. The summit 2021 science days will be facilitated and co-hosted by FAO on 8th and 9th July of this year. I'm also pleased to see that the young people are engaged to this event. As you know, younger generation is our future. It's a future for society, future for economy. Of course, it's a future for agriculture and the food systems. The role of the youth is a pivotal in the shaping agro-food system transformation. Their views will be an important contribution to the ongoing discussion in the region and beyond. FAO Youth Committee initiated the World Food Forum, powered by the global youth. And the forum will have its first major global event in October supposed to be after a uh, 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 food system summit, which will be the dedicated to the further of our agro-food systems. It will bring together youth group, influencers, and startups, along with uh, uh, youth networks from academic institutions, civil society, private sectors, uh, national authorities and the media and the international organizations, you name it, to drive in the awareness, involvement and, and the resources. Ladies and gentlemen, with the challenges, there comes opportunity. Let us assist them together. FAO will continue supporting the region's important efforts for better production, better nutrition, a better environment and a better life for all. I thank you and I wish you have a good debate and with a concrete suggestion. And I know the uh, representative from the uh, Food System Summit is here. So closely listening, what are you talking, what are you suggesting? Thank you. And thank you, here, here. And it's wonderful you did take the time to open our regional dialogue. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, when UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and his team decided on the necessity and importance to concentrate UN efforts towards food systems, he called upon Agnes Kalibata, as most of you know, former Rwandan agriculture minister and change maker in Africa, to be the spearhead of his high-level conference. Uh, as opposed to other UN summits, this conference, as you all know, is supposed to be process-driven, dialogue-driven, exchange-driven, and has uh, either sponsored or enhanced many dialogues on national and regional levels to feed into it. We are happy to greet now the deputy of the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Food Systems Summit, and uh, he has just traded Bonn uh, to, for Rome and the Climate Secretary to, for the Food Systems Summit. In a way, probably, Martin, you're actually looking at the global bundle of challenges just from a very different perspective. Thank you very much, Connie. Um, Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. And let me start by bringing warm greetings from the special envoy who unfortunately had another commitment and couldn't make it. This is a really timely um, meeting here. And I wanted to make four very quick points, as I know time is of the essence. The first one is we are in the midst of it. This is not a food summit, it's a food system summit. And with the systems approach, we are really trying to bring not only the traditional agricultural communities together, but also ministers and ministries of youth, health, environment, transport, everybody who should be committed to food systems. And moreover, it's an all of society approach. And this is really something that is getting to a dimension that is really exceeding our own expectations. Um, Vladimir has mentioned in the opening the many independent dialogues in the region. It's more than 400 globally. And what is really exciting, we have as of today, 123 nations who are steering national dialogues, including all of the government and all of their society. <clears throat> and, you know, one bit I really wanted to emphasize is that we are getting so much good feedback from civil society in all of these 123 nations that they can meaningfully contribute to the discussions particularly young people, which is very encouraging. We need holistic national and subnational and also regional approaches. And that is including the regions of countries and quite often also the big cities in countries and the hinterland. And we see increasingly how independent dialogues are complementing the national level dialogues to really achieve system thinking in all levels of government and governance which is important. The second bit I wanted to say is the central importance of making our food systems more inclusive. This is an SDG summit, and our overarching objective is, of course, SDG 2. The SDGs have pledged to leave no one behind. So our work particularly needs to start with listening to those who are furthest behind, indigenous population, rural poor, landless people, worker in food systems, and that is very close to our heart. There will be, however, no jobs on a dead planet. And we are mindful that, as an FAO study recently has stated, um, food systems contribute to more than a third of the global um, greenhouse gas emissions and are certainly the biggest driver for the loss of biodiversity. The good news is that modern production methods and also of traditional production methods are at hand to really make agricultural food production, but also forestry and fisheries, a driver of restoration. Replenishing fish stocks, restoring soil is important because we have already on a planetary level crossed quite a few red lines. Um, innovation is a very important bit. The director general spoke about it. And it goes in two directions. We have access to data and um, possibilities that were unthinkable 20 years ago. We can equip smallholder farmers with precision data really adapted to their individual needs. But innovation also means social innovation, participatory models, collective 
decision making, and we hope that this summit is setting a bit of the tone of that. And in this inclusion, the digital possibilities play a great role. And I'm really happy and I wanted to congratulate FAO and the regional office um, for being part of the food systems community. Our website in which we bring practitioners together, it's rapidly growing. My IT person tells me we are growing by 150 registered users a day. This is really encouraging because ultimately this is a peer-to-peer -to -peer tool. This is not our megaphone. This is for people to share their best practices. And let me conclude with an invitation. Um, this Friday, we will have a big civil society forum, and it would be fantastic to see all of you there as well to add a European and Eastern European voice to our global conversation. And with that, back to you, Connie. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Martin, and uh, keep up the energy. I think you will be needing it. Uh, our last opening speaker is a man deeply rooted in the region and doubly engaged with our dialogue, both as former representative of UNDP and now in his present job as Deputy Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Both organizations are, of course, part of the issue based coalition on sustainable food systems. So, Mitri, Marian, please take the floor and share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much, Connie, distinguished uh, uh, Director General, uh, ministers, colleagues, uh, dear participants. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join this opening of the Europe and Central Asia Regional Dialogue together with our partners in the issue-based coalition on sustainable food systems. Systemic changes in the way we produce, transport, consume, and dispose of food are absolutely critical for achieving sustainable development. Uh, the regional overview on food security and nutrition in Europe and Central Asia for 2020, which was just launched uh, recently, shows that both food insecurity and malnutrition continue to be significant challenges in our region. And of course, as was mentioned by the Director General, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made matters even worse, uh, and it, it disproportionately affects vulnerable populations. But the Europe and Central Asia region is also fertile ground for developing, testing, and proving solutions to these challenges, which is why this dialogue is a great opportunity to learn from the diverse experiences in our region about what policies it takes to really drive the transformation of our food systems towards sustainability. Uh, and I'm confident that we will hear today of a great value that the dialogue, the big picture global dialogue preceded by many regional and local ones at the UN Food System Summit, as Mr. Frick just outlined, will um, uh, contribute to this to this transformation. Let me say uh, a few words on one particular angle uh, on which we're increasingly working uh, on at the UN Economic Commission for Europe, uh, and which is really about systemic transformation. It is about circularity, transition to sustainable use of natural resources and circular economy, which was a key theme of the UN ECE's 69th Commission session just concluded uh, a month ago. As the Economic Commission covering the Europe and Central Asia region, we are particularly interested in looking at how we align Sustainable Development Goal 2 uh, with goals such as sustained and inclusive economic growth and productive employment, as well as sustainable consumption and production. So it is very much about SDG 2, but in our view, food systems, as, as was mentioned before, is really a whole of society, whole of government issue, and so needs to be looked at uh, holistically. One of ways of making our food systems more sustainable without compromising the economic growth, which is increasingly important in the post-COVID recovery phase, is the circular economy. Closing material loops, optimizing recycling opportunities, designing waste out of the system. Uh, and here comes the link to the innovation and digital enhanced data-driven approaches that were mentioned just now. Uh, very importantly, uh, we believe that concrete solutions exist already in, in, in the region, that learning from them, including from the startup community, which is booming in, in several countries in the agri-tech sphere, will be not just a source of innovation, but a source of new economic models, new business models that, that agribusinesses and governments across the region can take up and move their uh, agrarian economies towards circularity. Uh, we also hope that circularity will 
help expand the economic opportunities for those who actually engage in it and to expand consumer access to sustainably produce food. A lot of this is of course about lowering transaction costs and improving access to trustworthy information all the way from the field to the table and across borders. Uh, here, there are a number of solutions and that's why at UNIC we're developing internationally harmonized electronic standards as one such solution, many enabled by blockchain technology that make agricultural value chains more transparent and that reduce the costs of verifying compliance with sustainability standards. This should improve incentives for farmers, wholesalers and retailers to invest in innovative sustainable practices and should support them in entering higher value added market segments and earning higher incomes. So when we, when we talk sus sustainable use of natural resources in agriculture, when we talk circular economy, we also talk market access for the lower middle income countries in our region that should ultimately help many farmers thousands of farmers across the region come out of poverty and live a more dignified life. We're also working with governments, uh, currently with the Republic of Moldova and with Uzbekistan, and I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Minister of Agriculture uh, in today's event uh, from Uzbekistan on how to stimulate sustainability enhancing innovations in the agriculture sector. But much more can and must be done to transform our food systems towards more sustainability and more circularity. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that at the commission session in April, our 56 member states have issued a very firm commitment to scale up efforts to promote circular economy approaches. Uh, and we will be working with them and with all of you to make this happen in the region. This includes identifying, assessing and filling gaps in governance and good policy practices, which is exactly what we will be talking about here today. We also heard about very interesting specific national initiatives in several countries for reducing food waste and loss. And as UNC, we will be very pleased to share this information and work with all of you on this specific angle on sustainable use of natural resources, contributing to the work of the Food Systems Summit and its follow-up. UNIC is committed to supporting these efforts, and I believe the UN system as a whole can play an important role here. And allow me to note on behalf of our executive secretary, Mrs. Algoyerova, the highly effective collaboration within the issue-based coalition and highlight FAO's leadership in this regard. I look forward to working with the colleagues from the uh, IBC and with the countries of our region on our joint efforts to promote the sustainable agri-food sector, sustainable food systems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mitri. And um, for me, for my part, I love the idea of uh, getting the concept of circular economy also into the agricultural systems. In the industry, it's been already around for a number of years and solutions are there. So why shouldn't they uh, apply uh, on the agricultural side? Thank you so much. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have heard uh, one wonderful expert opening speakers have already put down a number of uh, bullet points, a number of issues that we're going to be discussed and give examples to from countries, uh, from the regions, from areas of the regions, from people uh, in the regions. Um, and uh, in order to get that started, we would just like to share with you a couple of testimonials uh, that are part and parcels of the observations of governments and others who live in and with our food system. So let's have a look at the testimonials.
and I'm quite sure we could go on and on and on, on. Many more testimonials were already um, assembled, uh, and this was just sort of an excerpt of uh, statements uh, made within uh, the national uh, dialogues and also in the dialogues uh, running up uh, to this event. And that gives me the chance to introduce uh, my talking partner. Actually, she would have been a keynote speaker. However, we decided to make it uh, a little bit of more of a dialogue in view of um, the dialogue uh, driven uh, point that we have. And uh, I would uh, like to introduce to you Jessica Fanzo. Uh, she is uh, a wonderful scientist and uh, has gotten up really, really early this morning because uh, she's uh, based uh, in the US. Uh, so uh, lots of coffee to get uh, away. Jessica Fanzo has had uh, not just an extensive academic background looking particularly at this region. She's uh, been uh, awarded uh, many excellencies uh, and uh, Today, uh, she is uh, chair of uh, a um, very specialized um, agricultural um, department in Maryland. So uh, first of all, uh, Jessica, um, let's go back to something that we've heard Martin Frick saying. And, and he said, um, we no longer are talking about a UN food summit. We're talking about a food systems summit. And he's already sort of given us an indication why it is important to have this systemic view on things. Um, would you just sort of take us along? Is it just a matter of vocabulary or what more is behind that? Yeah, thanks so much, Connie. And, and to it's, it's so nice to see everyone. And I'm sorry we can't be there in person together, but it's a real pleasure to at least see everyone's face and, and have this dialogue. Yeah, so I think right now we're in a moment where we have made a lot of progress on food security. We've made a lot of progress in building a certain type of food system, but we know that with the current challenges that we face, we need a different approach. And, and as Martin had talked about, this food systems approach is, is, is really important. And I'll bring up five reasons why we should take a systems approach. And the first is we have climate change disruption. Climate is barreling down on us. And the way we are producing foods and the type of foods that we're growing have uh, significant uh, contributions to climate change, significant contributions to creating environmental stress. And food systems themselves are quite vulnerable to climate. So when we think about earth systems, food systems are, are incredibly affected. A second reason is we have significant burdens of malnutrition, double, triple burdens. And this region of Europe and Central Asia is not immune to these burdens. About 10% of the population experience moderate and severe uh, levels of food insecurity, women particularly being impacted. And uh, obesity is a significant crisis for the region. A third reason to take a food systems approach is because food systems produce our diets, the, the food that we take pleasure in consuming every day. The diets are now a top risk factor of disease and death. And even in this region, healthy diets are unaffordable for about a third of, of the population. That's incredible that we cannot afford what is meant to nourish us. And two other reasons, Connie, is that zoonotic pandemics are not going anywhere and food and agriculture and the way we produce our food uh, is definitely part of the pandemic uh, situation that we have at hand. And food systems interact in a societal dance with other systems. COVID-19 was a health system shock, a global health system shock that it had implications on every other system, the economic system, the food system, the education system, you name it. But it shows that these systems that surround our lives every day and that we interact with 
are very much connected. And the last is that taking a systems approach, we're really seeing some of the inequities. Who gets access to a diet? Who's producing our food and are they protected? We know that many smallholders in the region of Europe and Central Asia are toiling away producing our food without a lot of fair wages, uh, protection against COVID and other exposures as they're producing their food. So we really need to be thinking about the whole employment sector and who uh, in, is, is valued in that, in that sector and the food system overall. So we've got some big challenges, Connie. And if we don't take a systems approach, it's going to be very difficult to, to really take uh, holistic solutions to address it. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. And just for the record, uh, this is your proper title, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food and Agricultural Policy and Ethics, Johns Hopkins University. So having it's said a that and having... Uh, <laughs> I liked your having, other introduction. Having, uh, you know, <laughs> put, put that in, uh, in there. And let's sort of continue from the food systems and, and the word systems again. Um, we have, of course, parallel debates. We have the climate change debate uh, and the SDG debate. And we always find that when you try to achieve one goal within all of that, you might find that you might worsen another. So there are certain trade-offs. In solving the challenge of the imbalanced food systems, what are the trade-offs um, that we have to be aware of? And can we actually avoid um, having to make a choice? Is there a win-win-win situation potentially? Inherently, policymakers, and we have many on this call, are always dealing with trade-offs. They're also dealing with synergies. Trade-offs are uh, inherent when you're taking a food systems approach. And we have many examples historically where we've uh, taken on global, regional country policies that have benefited a part of the food system and maybe had detrimental impact in another system. People always use the Green Revolution as an example of something very powerful and producing lots of food and avoiding famine in particularly the Asia region, but had externalities and trade-offs to the environment, to nutrition. It's kind of a classic example historically. But what's challenging is that policymakers are trying to get as much information as they can to make sound decisions. And they don't always have information at the present time and what will happen in the future. So they're dealing a bit in the unknown. Um, those of us who work in research and work on data are trying to create better food systems data in the present time, better modeling and scenario data for future times to help decision makers navigate in the light and not the dark and to be able to see trade-offs and weigh those with priorities and synergies. Can we have it all? Can we win, win, win across environment, human health, economic growth? It depends. Depends on many things. Governance, getting the power balance right, engaging uh, those who are being left behind, let's smallholders for this region, particularly women. It's gonna depend on good governance. It's gonna depend on solid investment and a data-driven decision-making process. So we can actually take a little bit of time on that. Um, who is driving the process? Um, we here in this particular dialogue uh, are part and parcel of, as I said, a dialogue, a process, uh, um, almost sort of equals talking to each other, but um, you address decision makers. Is that just the government who needs to make decisions? Uh, who is in the driver's seat? I, well, I hope that governments are in the driver's seat and I hope they are shepherding and navigating and guiding 
and providing incentives for all the other food system actors that are working in their country and in their region. Um, you know, where I live in the United States, government does some driving, but private sector, particularly large companies are definitely in the passenger seat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with the foot on the gas pedal. Um, so to me, the governments are really key to this, but they need to be empowered. Um, they need uh, significant investment and funding going towards food. But we have so many private sector actors from very multinationals to small scale uh, entrepreneurs. And they too need to be incentivized and empowered to promote public health goals, promote environmental sustainability while ensuring that they, their business model holds up. So government's really in the driver's seat, but also, and hopefully maybe Sophie will talk about this, consumers, particularly those under 30, are inc have incredible power in the food system. Their decisions really matter. It, they really shape how food systems and food supplies will be directed. So we can't underestimate the power of choice, the power of the consumer, the power of social movements. These are powerful actors we, that are important for the food system, yeah. We, we will address that uh, both uh, in panel one and uh, we also have a beautiful little video uh, that's gonna be at the end of our conversation. Um, but um, forgive me if I, if I use the phrase, are there any low hanging fruit, i.e. things that sort of, you know, are easy, cheap and bring about a very big um, output? Well, I think there's, there's really, to me, four uh, significant things we need to do. And, and we know really how to fix them. Again, it's the matter of good governance, incentives, and investment. One is increasing the availability of nutrient-rich foods in the food supply. Now, there's lots of ways to do that, changing agriculture subsidies, but even more so, uh, investing in agriculture infrastructure in places where there's a lot of opportunity to grow those foods where there's potential to scale up the growth of nutrient rich foods. The second is ensuring that food is accessible. Of course, that means cutting food loss and waste, but it also means supporting job growth, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, there's innovations along food value chains. The third is ensuring food is affordable. In this region, all over the world, 3 billion people cannot get access to a healthy diet. Many ways to promote uh, affordability of these, of these foods, including safety nets, social protection, taxes and subsidies, taxing unhealthy foods, subsidizing healthy foods. And then last is ensuring that food is pleasurable and desirable. These four things are sort of Every country needs them. They're the low hanging fruit. Now, how you deal with climate and environmental stress is very local, local context, locally dependent on the decisions that are made. Each area is affected a bit differently by uh, climate change and by different uh, natural resource base. So, but to me, when we think about the backbone of food systems, and that is ensuring that healthy diets are available, accessible, affordable, and desirable, every country is grappling with those four challenges, but we know what to do. There's been a lot of evidence of what works in different countries. So to me, Connie, those are kind of the big four that every country has in common. Despite all the discrepancies and the uh, sort of layout uh, and, of course, the um, uh, way in which agriculture is carried out uh, in a certain country. Now, um, we, we do just a very quick point of information. I have one more minute than we did have uh, originally. So let me just 
spend one question on something that we had not pre-discussed, but you've mentioned it three times now. Uh, you said there is a high gender aspect uh, to bad nutrition uh, and affordability, and it's particularly women and I suppose uh, in extension children that mm. are particularly hit uh, in the region. Uh, why is that? Various reasons. There's a lot of gender uh, inequality and inequity. Inequality meaning sameness <laughs> and, and the lack of equal access to things, but equity goes much deeper in that um, it goes into fairness. So women are, are, are disempowered uh, in society. Uh, women working in the food system are not uh, incentivized. They don't get access to the same financial resources, the same information resources. So there's the whole area we, where we need to ensure that women have voice, they have agency, and they're empowered. And Connie, I think you and I know as women, we see that play out in every sector at every level where um, women sometimes are, are undermined. And it's, it's really problematic and, and particularly women of color or women of a certain caste, it's even more, um, more stark for them. The other issue is that women have special nutritional needs uh, throughout their life cycle. And as do children. And that's important. Whether or not women decide to have children, they have certain nutritional needs that need to be valued and, and nurtured throughout the entire life cycle. So they should be prioritized. Thank you so much uh, for this, uh, let me say, sidestep. Um, uh, wrapping up and uh, looking beyond. Uh, we're all gearing up to this uh, massive uh, um, food system summit uh, in September in New York. But of course, beforehand, we have the one in Rome and all these dialogues, all uh, the um, like, for example, the issue based coalition has been put into place, has been discussing um, but what's going to happen in 2022. It's a, great, it's a great question that has a big question mark for me. I wish Martin was still here because we could ask him, but <laughs> I really hope that um, it lasts, right? I hope that commitments that are firm are made at the summit and countries ad adhere to those commitments and fulfill those commitments. What worries me is a bit like the Millennium Development Goals, or even the Sustainable Development Goals, there's no real accountability mechanism to them. Countries aren't penalized if they don't reach those goals. Not that we want countries to be penalized, but where's the, the teeth to, to the summit? Does it have some sort of accountability mechanism? Does it have concrete goals that the world is going to get to for the food sum summit? Or will we just use the SDGs as, as the goal setting, which worries me a bit. Um, mm. So I'm hoping that there's some kind of an accountability me mechanism um, that, that countries sign up and, and adopt. That's, that's my goal, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, we might not want to have another process like COP26 for climate and COP15 for biodiversity and um, all the traveling uh, that used to be uh, associated with yeah. it, uh, which uh, can also not uh, help. Jessica, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, and for you, the early hour for us, uh, of course, it's the middle of the day, so we're quite awake. Um, thanks very much. Maybe you stay towards the end and uh, maybe we have the chance to talk again. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, you have seen the program entails two big panels, one more directed towards the social issues uh, that we have been talking about, uh, consumers' rights, consumers' voices, choices in the food system. The other one is going to be a little bit more on the environmental aspects, etc. cetera. Um, but in order to get into our first panel, we have something really lovely. There are two beautiful sisters uh, from Kazakhstan. And when I mean beautiful, I mean beautiful minds, Medina and Fatima, and uh, they do what do youngsters do. Uh, they have a YouTube channel. They uh, are actually uh, 
um, broadcasting to their peers. And we are going to share one of those uh, aspects that they've shared with their world. And by the way, I'm not quite sure whether they're still Generation X, Z, or already Generation Alpha. But whatever they are, just have a look at this. Привет! Меня зовут Фатима и Медина Майсар. Мы сестры и блогеры из Казахстана, город Алматы. Мне 14 лет, а мне 16. Мы школьницы. Мы занимаемся защитой про детей в Казахстане. И также мы волонтеры ЮНИСЕФ. Сегодня мы расскажем вам о том, как питаются казахстанские дети, какие у них предпочтения в еде, насколько правильно их меню и какие проблемы существуют в Казахстане в области питания детей. Сразу хотим предупредить, что это будет сугубо наш детский взгляд на эту тему. Медина, ты проголодалась? Да, я бы что-нибудь поела. А чем бы ты перекусила? Яблоком или бананом? Хм. Я бы перекусила сладким. Мы опросили наших uh -huh. ровесников о том, какую еду они предпочитают, знают ли они о правильном питании и как часто они едят вредную для здоровья пищу. Из их ответов мы сделали вывод – что у детей любимыми являются блюда, которыми их кормят дома, которые готовятся в семье и являются традиционными. В Казахстане, как и в других соседних государствах Центральной Азии, национальные блюда состоят по большей части из всевозможных мучных изделий, мяса и некоторого количества круп и овощей. Мы сами подростки, и мы знаем, что наши ровесники очень мобильны. Они предпочитают гулять вне стен дома. Они сидят на улице, катаются на велосипедах или самокатах. И они, и они покупают еду на вынос, потому что им важно, чтобы ожидание, пока еда приготовится, не занимало слишком много времени. А напитки они покупают, которые находятся тут же рядом, и чтобы они были охлажденными. Сейчас правительство Казахстана делает много шагов в сторону того, чтобы питание школьников было правильным и здоровым. В школьных столовых запрещена продажа мучных изделий, газированных напитков и сладостей. Но ученики, имея карманные деньги, все равно приобретают чипсы, газировку, конфеты и сладкую выпечку в ближайших магазинчиках. Дети знают, что эти продукты вредны для их организма. Но понимание, как именно действуют быстрые углеводы, какой конкретно вред они несут здоровью, у них нет. В школах нет отдельной программы, информирующей об этом. Мы надеемся, что благодаря правильной экономической политике и общим усилиям в 21 веке мы сможем не просто сделать так, чтобы у каждого ребенка была еда, но и добьемся того, чтобы все продукты, которые потребляют дети, были здоровыми и полезными. Well, fantastic. Um, those influencers really have it sussed and um, the very interesting observations are going to be reverberated, certainly uh, with one of our panelists. Let me just uh, quickly uh, say that the next 40 minutes uh, we'll be discussing key policy issues, specific challenges, opportunities and share good practices on strengthening governance for sustainable food systems. And we are, of course, looking at the shaping of of the food system that is more equitable, empowering all consumers and pro protecting the most vulnerable by ensuring access to safe, nutritious food and inclusive economic livelihood. In order to do that, I do have a wonderful co-moderator, Amir Yapara of UNICEF uh, Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia is with me. Uh, he's based in Almaty and I'd say welcome Amir. Thank you very much to, for being by my side. Pleasure to me. Thank you very much, Connie and colleagues. Extremely be happy and pleased, pleased to be here. Thank you. Grand. And now let me very briefly introduce our panel. We are happy to discuss all these issues with Anna Murad Nazarov, Chief Specialist, State Century Epidemiological Inspection, Ministry of Health of Turkmenistan. Hello. He is there, Arman Kojoran, the Deputy Minister responsible for agriculture at the Ministry of Economics from Armenia. Thank you very much for being on the line with us. We have Doris Letina. She's the Vice President of the European Council of Young Farmers and uh, is actually producing fruit, as we've seen, you know, the supplier of the positive 
sweets that we can eat. And Alamen Harag Yunan Yan is the director of the EC Agricultural Policy Department at the Eurasian Economic Commission. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Zaklina Stojanovic, uh, the professor at Belgr Belgrade University, Faculty of Economics, and I'm quite sure that you have listened uh, to the food choices uh, that the girls were describing very much. Uh, let's get started uh, uh, with the um, Deputy Minister. Uh, what in your, in your view can be done to facilitate different government agencies to working together, as we've heard earlier, you know, you don't just need sort of one um, uh, part, but uh, you need to have the buy-in of all in order to have improved policies for improving nutrition for the environment, for children, women, and youth. So how do you do that? Thank you very much, Connie. Uh, let me be very honest to you and to our auditorium, because I think that we are here to bring up uh, all the problems and then try to address them. So there is no governmental agency in Armenia which doesn't have a strategy. Well developed or not so, it doesn't matter a lot. But one of the big challenges I face at work is that you develop a 10 year strategy for the sector decide an action plan for the coming, let's say three years, and suddenly people who are in charge of implementation are replaced from their positions. A strategy means that when you approve the direction for the next steps, it becomes irrelevant to the question who is in charge of the current position. The newcomer should stick on the design pathway, doubtlessly just to very quickly changing the environment, but keep the approved direction in the meantime, each agency, ministry is developing its own strategy without synchronizing with each other, without knowing what and when the complementary activity is planned by another ministry or governmental agency. The important point is that such strategy is not developed in line with the other ministries already developed strategy. This type of work can be applied for improving nutrition, envi environment, food safety, or inclusive economic development. So having said that, I do believe that in order to create an effective cooperation and facilitation between governmental agencies or other stakeholders for establishment better food safety systems, it's necessary to create a formal platform for cooperation between all concerned parties to present their observations concerns and recommendations, as well as for brainstorming and discussing several policy issues. This platform will also serve for adjusting the action plans with the ministries and synchronizing the activities. Currently, the Ministry of Economy of Armenia acts as the policy making authority and we have created formal two such platforms, also engaging Armenian diaspora professionals in it. So, however, we are also cooperating with all of the existing platforms, which represents different players of the sector, including NGOs, governmental agencies, private sector, international organizations, banks, and farmers. So the important functions of the platform include regular meetings, cooperation between separate beneficiaries groups, also with the Ministry of Economy, and creation of new policy regulations and business environment. Very fascinating. And I know that we're going to come back to you uh, in the later part uh, to ask uh, some more specific questions. Uh, but I'd just like to hand over to Amir for his next questions. Thank you very much, Connie and colleagues. Again, it's uh, extremely a pleasure for me to be here with you. I have a question to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Ana Murad Mazarov, the Chief Specialist State Sanitary Epidemiological Inspection from Ministry of Health of Turkmenistan. Dr. Uh, Nazarov, you have a vast experience in the health sector and Turkmenistan involved in a lot of food and nutrition policy and programs. I want to know what policy actions are available to address the specific nutritional challenges of most vulnerable groups in your society, especially children, youth, and women. Uh, 
So over to you, Dr. Nazarov. Спасибо, Амир. Уважаемые дамы и господа, коллеги, в Туркменистане Министерство здравоохранения и медицинской промышленности проводит постоянную и планомерную работу по улучшению качества помощи детям с фокусом на правильное питание. Обучение родителей уходу и стимулирование развития детей любви и защиты самые разные ранние годы жизни. Законодательная и нормативная база пересмотрена в соответствии с международным требованиям. В феврале 2020 года постановлением президента Туркменистана принята новая национальная программа здорового питания населения Туркменистана на 2020-2025 годы направленное на достижение целоустойчивого развития, это, в особенности это СУР-2 и СУР-3 в отношении детей и женщин. С 2016 года функционирует у нас закон Туркменистана о поддержке и пропаганде грудного вскармливания. И 2017 года национальная программа по совершенствованию программ питания детей грудного и раннего возраста. В Туркменистане одним из приоритетных направлений данной программы является обеспечение населения безопасным и качественным продуктом питания. Контроль качества и безопасности пищевых продуктов осуществляется как на уровне производства, так и на государственном уровне. Создан Национальный центр общественного здоровья и питания с современным оснащением и расширенными возможностями лабораторных исследований в сфере питания. Усовершенствована система регистрации и сертификации производимых и импортированных пищевых продуктов. В стране проводится обязательное массовое обогащение таких пищевых продуктов, как пищевая соль, пшеничная мука. В ноябре 2004 года, все мы знаем, наверное, Туркменистан вручен международный сертификат о достижении универсальной ядизации соли для устойчивой ликвидации ядотребицитных нарушений. А в 2011 году Туркменистан удостоен награды за лидерство в деле фортификации пшеничной муки. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nazarov. Uh, definitely I will get back to you to continue this interesting conversation. And it is extremely interesting that within the panel, we also have colleagues from EEC that I guess Connie will get to uh, get to those questions. It would be, I think, really a conversation coming up soon. Connie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, before addressing the uh, director of the uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Commission, I would actually like to bring in the view of the academic. And uh, we've been talking about sort of nutrition quite a bit. And um, we've had this statement from our influencers from Kazakhstan. We heard uh, from them that there's a discrepancy between what is good food and what is desirable for youngsters, like sweets, fat foods, fast foods, etc. So, uh, Jarklina uh, Stoyanova, uh, Stoyanovic, uh, Professor, there are, of course, a number of dimensions on the consumer's part. They are the kind of choices that they can make, depending on what foods are out there in the uh, market and, and in the shops. But there's also the question of what they can afford, as we've heard already. And then there's a question of making informed decisions on what to buy and what to cook. So many, many uh, dimensions there, like in some Western European states, you have whole industry based on bio natural balanced foods, even mainlined, i.e. in big supermarkets. And let's face it, not everybody is actually making the right decisions, but in the end, they might be buying chips. So what's the situation you observe in the Balkans? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, and uh, I will address this consumer perspective in uh, the whole story regarding sustainability. Uh, so it is uh, very important to bring consumer perspective in discussion. Um, uh, in other words, uh, it is really important to find out what consumers really want. 
so consumers uh, are important, as Jessica mentioned at the, at the beginning of our discussion. Uh, show, so I can briefly share the results for Western Balkan countries, the region uh, I coming from. Uh, the research pointed out the sensory appeal, appeal followed by purchase convenience as the most important food choice motives for a modern consumer in the region. Uh, it is important to notice that this rank is, ranking is completely similar to the ranking obtained in the other European uh, countries. Uh, it seems that consumers simply want tasty food, which, is, uh, which can be both at the nearest shop to his home. So he looks for purchase convenience. Uh, it is also important to emphasize that health and price are identified as the third and the fourth uh, motive uh, for food uh, choice on our list. So regarding sustainability aspects, uh, there is a difference between developed and developing countries, uh, particularly regarding health uh, issues, health as the motive for food choice. In developed countries, it is seen as a single motive. Uh, however, in Eastern and developing countries, health is additionally connected with natural content of the food. Uh, so the motive for food choice in these countries is health and natural content. Uh, to explain a little bit more, uh, consumers look for nutritional label on the food and they want to see that food contains no artificial ingredients. Uh, that is what our research uh, pointed out. In region with lower GDP per capita, price might have the crucial role in food choice motives. It bring, brings us to the conclusion that farmers should apply the best practices in the context of production methods to offer tasty and healthy food at affordable prices in the region. Unfortunately, ethical concerns, which is the most important, are the least on, the least, uh, on this list of the motives for dietary choice in our region. The interaction with consumers in this context is a little bit harder than it was expected. Uh, however, as far as environmental as aspects are uh, concerned, direct uh, farmer-consumer relations uh, through short uh, food supply uh, chains significantly influence farmers' willingness uh, to apply adequate technology and to reduce chemical uh, inputs in their practices just to meet consumer needs. Uh, suggesting that consumer interactions in short food supply chains has the potential to significantly affect environmental sustainability of food system. To conclude, both consumers and producers, farmers must be further educated about the importance of different aspects of sustainability of food system. Additionally, it is also possible to identify common characteristic of consumers in wider region uh, if they are historically or culturally or, for example, uh, uh, in the same so socioeconomic environment placed. For example, in West Balkan countries, we have identified five consumer groups or market segments. And it is also important, not only from the producer perspectives, but also from the policymakers point of view, as they uh, can uh, bring the common strategies regarding public health improvement and overall sustainability might be uh, also improved using the, uh, the common strategies in the reach. So it is the main uh, ideas I want to share with uh, participants regarding consumers perspective. Zaklina, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that gives uh, a great uh, overview, and I'm quite sure whilst the numbers might differ, some of uh, the main sort of uh, aspects and the categories uh, might apply for other countries in uh, the region outside the Balkans as well. Um, Amir, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Connie and colleagues. Uh, actually, I have myself a question to Dr. Armin, uh, Armin Hartunian. Uh, the di director of the Eurasian uh, Economic Commission Agricultural Policy Department. First of all, nice to meet you. Um, uh, Dr. Alman, I have a question. What role can a regional body such as yours play to improve the nutrition in the region or among the member states of the Eurasian uh, uh, Economic Commission? And at the same time, ensure uh, we have functioning and fair systems for everyone in, in, this, in the region. So over to you, Alman. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join the regional dialogue. Nice to meet you. And it's always a pleasure to join FAO organized events. 
Uh, at first, I'd like to highlight that the Eurasian Economic Union as a regional economic and trade union has the strategy of development 2025, which highlights sustainability, inclusiveness, and technologies, among many other priorities. And of course, as, an, as a department which is in charge of agri-industrial complex, we've been working with the member states to ensure implementation of the policies that would target those issues that have been mentioned by you. In terms of the food security in general, and considering the COVID-19, we've been highlighting three areas of support and cooperation, which includes production, supply chain, and value chain development. Among all points, we've been highlighted programs that would ensure access, accessibility, affordability, and availability of the food. Since the union covers economic issues, we rather put emphasis and highlight policies on increasing effectiveness, efficiency, and sustainability of the production, which would eventually bring to a better nutrition. For example, one of the projects that we've been discussing now at the union level is development of the uh, trade logistics that would make food more affordable and accessible mm. in all parts of the union, considering the size of the union and the diversity of the population living in different parts, we think that's an important point. Another policy document that we've been discussing at the moment at the union is the, the concept of the food security, which includes awesome measures uh, which we impose in, in cases of, uh, say, crises such as COVID-19. Last year, a platform was formed which bring together all members and based on that platform will allow participants in case of the emergency situation to apply to the managing body of the platform in order to ensure that the population in all member states have access to affordable food. That mechanism was uh, basically designed to kind of confer the problems that we faced during the COVID-19 crisis. Of course, I have to mention that the self-sufficiency level of the union in general is 93% at the moment. But some of the things when we see still a vulnerability is the production resources. And some of the policies at the moment is also targeting on developing and conservation of the indigenous varieties of the seeds and seedlings, also in terms of the developing a better genetics for our union. In other words, the policies are many, but what we're trying to accomplish, as I mentioned in the beginning, is to ensure that we have the uh, principles of the green economy, uh, principles of the circular economy uh, to be designed and integrated in different national policies of the member states, but simultaneously we'll look at the production value chain development and the supply chain in general to ensure food availability, accessibility, and affordability. Thank you very much, Dr. Hartinian. It has been really uh, exciting to, to hear to this, and I'm sure definitely colleagues and other participants also are interested to hear from you more. I'll get back definitely to you with uh, some follow-up questions on that, but let me just pass this now to Connie for, for the next question. Thank you very much, Amir. And uh, you see, ladies and gentlemen, what we're trying to do is sort of we let everybody sort of uh, put down the ground. And I already see that you, uh, the observers, the audience, have already put some very interesting questions into the chat function. Uh, please continue to do so. Uh, we're going to get there. But of course, we haven't addressed everybody yet. So uh, I'm very happy to bring into the conversation Doris Litina. And Doris is the Vice President of the European Council of Young Farmers. As I said, uh, she is producing hopefully great apples uh, and affordable apples based in Slovenia. Uh, now, uh, Doris, um, being primary food producers, um, farmers are of course at the heart of our food system, um, but you have to watch these days, all these three aspects. You have to sort of uh, work economically, quite obviously, uh, you need to take care of the environment even beyond your farm and you sort of have to look out uh, for the social aspect. So is that something uh, that provides or that is a challenge uh, for a 
farmer doesn't he have uh, he or she have enough to do to actually uh, till the soil to see to it that uh, apples uh, or the flowers don't uh, uh, freeze when suddenly it's too cold? Uh, thank you, Connie. First, thank you to ha have me here. Uh, uh, yes, being a farmer, especially being a young farmer, is challenging for itself. Um, if you let me, I will highlight three main challenges uh, that we are facing as young farmers, not just young farmers, also farmers, but still. Uh, so firstly, access to land, uh, access to finance, and of course, decent income. And then thirdly, access to knowledge. I'm very glad that uh, different stakeholders are here today, uh, different stakeholders that, that also can help to address these challenges. Uh, so if we start access to land for farmers, there is strong land concentration. Um, there's also low degree of mobility and transfer. Then price of the land, it's pretty expensive. And we cannot also forget about urban sprawling. Uh, that is that is first. If we want to, to start farming, we need a land uh, when we can produce the food we are talking about today. So how to nutrition food. Uh, then secondly, we also need knowledge. Without knowledge, uh, so knowledge and innovation uh, that needs to be accessible, affordable for farmers, and of course useful. Uh, if I just point out here a uh, connection between researchers and farmers that needs to be not just on paper, but also, also in field. Uh, and one of the important places for exchanging of knowledge, it's also the event as today. I'm sure that uh, these different links are helping uh, to exchanging knowledge and skills. Um, also peer-to-peer so -peer learning, it's extremely important uh, to mention mentoring system, not just in the sector, but also outside the sector. Uh, that's for sure one of the most effective way of knowledge transfer. Uh, then sharing experience, best, best practices, also the worst practices, because uh, that's, uh, that's also uh, something where we can grow. Um, as I mentioned, and event that is today. Um, but all the knowledge is useful if you cannot put it in practice. And this can not happen without access to finance. Uh, we were talking today about affordable food. Of course, that's that's very important, but if there is no, no decent income for farmers, we, we cannot have sustainable production. We cannot have healthy food yeah. we are talking about. Um, and young farmers are not just a decent income, also access to finance in general. Young farmers are more often rejected by banks uh, and setting in sector with old finance, it's, it's not possible, uh, especially in this, uh, extraordinary times uh, and when in these times being good is not always enough and development yeah, in agriculture development it's the only constant uh, so investing in environmental friendly farming a uh, strong risk management strategy uh, then whole or, or, or direct selling then general resilience um, so there are a lot of challenges but not just challenges, there are also a lot of opportunities. Uh, but first we need to address challenges that we can start reaching all these opportunities. And on the end of the day, uh, what only matters is sustainability. As you said, not just economical, but also social and environmental. And I don't mean here just for the farm, for the sector, but also for the farmer. That we young farmers will see the bright future and that we will be the ones who will co-creating this sector with all of you as uh, stakeholders. And I'm pretty sure that uh, also all the today's panelists, all the today's attendees can do something uh, to co-create better, better agriculture sector, better food system, not just for the consumer uh, to, to have affordable and healthy food, but also yes. for the farmer who's on the beginning of this, uh, of this process. Doris, 
<laughs> your, your heart is quite obviously very full of uh, everything uh, that you concern yourself with. And uh, of course, you, you are talking uh, to all your colleagues uh, around Europe. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, your views and your analysis. Um, I think the one aspect that you mentioned also was finance. Uh, and uh, maybe we're going to uh, get some answers to that in the second panel. But um, right at the moment, I would like to bring in somebody into the conversation uh, whose prime job uh, is uh, concerned with one aspect that is sort of being hailed as the big new thing uh, in agriculture, and that's digitization. Uh, the promise of more yields, digitization of innovation on farms and in the system. So I'd just like to do a quick reality check with Jaroslav Ponder, who is the head of the Office for Europe of the International Telecommunications Union. Um, Yaroslav, um, I've just sort of mentioned everything that we associate with the positive outcome of higher and more digitization uh, in the industry. And um, the question is, there's always a difference between reality and promise. Where are we in the region and uh, what needs to happen in order to keep to the promise rather than to uh, reality? Absolutely. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for uh, inviting us on this special occasion. Uh, of course, as the specialized agency being in charge of the ICTs, uh, we are uh, advocating for the enabling role of the ICTs, uh, which can change uh, the way how the agricultural system and the food system uh, works, uh, making it uh, much more efficient, but also and taking into account the interest of the end users, uh, those who are consuming on the daily basis um, and, um, and uh, they can benefit also from the ICTs uh, in order to um, consume healthier uh, and uh, to become healthier. Uh, of course, during the COVID, uh, all of us, we experienced uh, uh, how dependent we are on the digital infrastructure uh, and how uh, digital can change our life. But this uh, was experienced by those who are connected, but there is several um, millions of the people who are still disconnected. Only in Europe, we are talking about over 80 million who are not connected. They are in reach of the ICTs, but they are not connected. And this makes us a little bit worried uh, once we are talking about a real impact of the digital on the uh, food systems. And here, of course, we have the two uh, dimensions of this. Uh, one is on the side of the demand where the end consumer would like to know more uh, how and to um, uh, eat healthier uh, using the uh, series of the new applications, providing the, uh, such a range of the opportunities uh, to really to behave um, um, more in the more sustainable way, uh, also contributing to the circular economy or contributing to the sustainable development, uh, but also by the end of the day, also become healthier thanks to the uh, better food. Uh, and also the, uh, these platforms are providing easy access to the healthier food, what is a very important and growing market uh, for the ICT uh, sector. Uh, and uh, more and more becomes relevant, but again, we are coming uh, to the question uh, who can in fact benefit out of this. Uh, when we are taking a look at the Europe and Central Asia, we are still facing a significant uh, digital divide. So several people are disconnected and we are only taking a look at the averages uh, for the countries. When we are diving into the rural areas where the areas are non-profitable, there's no investment in the fast broadband, then we are really uh, having a challenge of exclusion. Exclusion of the end user, consumer, but on the other hand, very important component of those who are producing. And here we are I'm coming to the very important point and that uh, the emerging technologies these days are offering such a great opportunities uh, for uh, bringing the efficiency to the food systems, making sure that uh, the, such a technologies like the Internet of Things, 
um, smart sensing systems, uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence for agriculture uh, are really in use and bringing this what we would expect from the food uh, system um, as the end uh, users. Of course, artificial intelligence is for all of, uh, for many of us, the, the new novum. Face recognition is something what we know from the television and so from some reporting, but it's reality. It's happening on the daily basis in uh, some advanced economies where the face recognition recognition, for example, for swines uh, is a daily a daily business, improving the efficiency uh, of, of the business uh, and also touching upon the health uh, systems. So from our side, in order to make all this possible, we have only one advocacy to take a look at this um, digitalization and digital transformation of agriculture from systemic point of view, embedding this in the strategies and making sure that it's also touching uh, all uh, the agriculture uh, system. So thank you very much for bringing us to this discussion <laughs> on this very important uh, item. Thank you. Lovely, you already heard me sort of uh, trying to intervene um, as I'm having a look at the time. And uh, I think the answers uh, in our second uh, part of the discussions need to be uh, a bit more snazzy and to the point. And uh, Amir is going to put the first question, please. Thank you very much, uh, Connie colleagues. I have a question to Dr. Arman Khojayan, uh, the Deputy Minister of Agriculture in Armenia. Um, Dr. Arman, what do, you what do you think it needs to be done to ensure that the uh, value chains and the private sector can respond and meet the needs of the consumer to provide nutritious and diverse foods? Over to you, Arman. Thank you very much for the question. So the government of Armenia has adopted a system approach which ensures inclusive value chains development. Furthermore, during the first dialogue conducted in Armenia within the frames of UNFSS, it was reaffirmed that a cooperation, especially between the government and private sector, uh, is uh, vital in finding solutions for building strong agriculture production and healthy diets for the population. In this regard, investing in SMEs along the value chain is widely supported by the government, as due to that small businesses are strengthened, household level incomes increase, jobs are created, educational opportunities arise. People have access to nutrition and safe food. Investments are made in innovative and green technologies that address climate change. This acts a buffer when a shock hits and allow for speedy and more solid recovery. So this is a new way of thinking and doing business that leverages on the problem of malnutrition and hunger to achieve multiple gains, economic growth, jobs, education, and a healthier and productive population. In addition, investments in roads and infrastructure is another point where the state and private sector meet. As the more developed is the state, the more infrastructures the private sector creates for the state. In this regard, for such country, for developing country, the state development support programs are crucial. One thing is certain, the role of the food value chain for nutrition should not, should not be underestimated in terms of identifying innovative ways of improving the availability, affordability, and acceptability of nutritious food, both in the context of undernutrition and the context of overweight obesity. And there is currently a push for policymakers in terms of supporting actions along the food value chains that can contribute to healthier consumption patterns. However, there's also a role for the private sector. Applying a business lens to nutrition will help identify opportunity for integrating nutrition into food value chains with the goal of increasing availability and acceptability of nutritious food. Thank you much. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. You. Portrayal has been, uh, I think, very interesting, and I would definitely want to learn more about it. And I guess that's what that, that's where we reach out. So over back to you, Connie. Uh, let's continue with this as the time is also pressing. Yes, uh, we've got ten minutes left for this uh, discussion. So Doris, uh, we've we've heard uh, a long statement from you. Could you just sort of pinpoint um, where you see innovation happening? maybe even innovation, especially driven by the young farmers. So where do you and your colleagues look to when you say, 
there've been old traditional ways of production, old traditional ways um, in the supply chain. We need to change that. Where do you look to? Uh, I will be very briefly. Uh, I just want to point out that we have very diverse farm. Uh, in my area, my own farm, also across the euro, we have big farms, small farms, extra small farms, then low technology to high technology, all kinds of sectors. Uh, also, resources are very different. So also innovation uh, that can be implemented on the farm uh, needs to be uh, very diverse. We don't, we don't, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the solution uh, one one size fit all would be would be good. So uh, we need to find different tools that farmers can choose and implement on the farm. So as much as possible, of course, sustainable, and um, it needs to be affordable and useful for the farmers. Thank you so much. And just very very quickly, one sentence from your own personal experience: How digitized is your apple production? Uh, it's, uh, it depends. If you are speaking about my farm, uh, we don't have uh, very digitals. Uh, we are starting uh, to do it, but everything starts and ends with the money. So also resources are something that are um, the, the, the barrier or the opportunity. But hopefully uh, it will change. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much for that sort of uh, personal picture that you've painted. Uh, Jadlinka, um, we've now heard uh, um, uh, several times from, from Doris uh, and also from others uh, that finance, of course, needs uh, to be there, but you need a financial model, government support. Um, so um, how would you price in a finance, but also sort of, you know, the concentration on small and medium sized uh, companies? Okay, you can hear me now. Uh, so uh, one financial model uh, might fit uh, large producers. Uh, they usually want to be heavily subsidized in the context of technology improvement in order to be more efficient and to address properly all environmental issues, for example. On the other side, we have small holders uh, who already apply low input uh, technology by definition because they are poor. Uh, so, uh, we need to solve different problems regard, regarding uh, financial aspects uh, in uh, this area related to small uh, holders. From the financial point of view, we can address best their needs by specific microfinance system or credit lines. But my opinion is that these producers might be, might, uh, have to be supported by other means as well. Uh, financial support will not bring better off for these producers if we miss other aspects. I uh, think on organization and knowledge transfer already mentioned by other uh, participants in the, this dialogue. And both uh, belong to the so social innovations uh, in the food uh, system functioning. So farmers uh, should be better connected with other producers. I mean, uh, through producers, groups or unions or cooperatives to strengthen their position at the market. Uh, it is the first step. But if they are even better organized, they will face with unfair trade practices. Uh, it is a huge problem identified in uh, the recent research. Therefore, policymakers should foster adoption of regulation regarding unfair trade practices in agricultural and food chain. I also think uh, about the second aspect uh, mentioned by Doris and uh, Jaroslav. It covers better extension service for small uh, farmers. Uh, the advisors must be, uh, must be better organized to improve the small hold holders' practices. For example, in Serbia, we have Biosense Institute, which is, which is private-public uh, partnership, and they offer free of charge information and advice for, for small stakeholders. Uh, for, for example, a farmer can uh, ask and send just a picture from the field. And according to all the information in, in the big data, uh, system will replay what kind of uh, practices uh, he should apply on 
his fields to improve uh, production. It will bring, bring a better env environmental sustainability for farmers and, of course, in, uh, will improve their uh, uh, practices. Uh, it will also improve their income. Uh, at least they will be available uh, to uh, support small markets, local markets with the local food, healthy food, uh, offered to the consumers. So my message is to tailor the public support to meet farmers' needs e efficiently, uh, particularly needs of smallholders in rural regions, as they are vital for many reasons, economic, social, environmental, political, whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amir. Thank you, Connie, and thank you, Doris. I want to go back to my dear friend, Dr. Hartunian from the uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union. As you know, there are several factors outside the national food systems, uh, but yet they can influence them heavily. You know, the EU is a key player in a, like the group of member states in facilitating trade among the members and harmonizing the standards and trade barriers. How do you see food system approach uh, could be sometimes affected by um, uh, certain policies or standards of the EU? I put you an example. For example, the larger scale flour fortification or saltization is among the national strategies in the region to fight micronutrient deficiencies. Sometimes the one of the means to control uh, the quality of this program is to control the imports and trade across the borders. And uh, the different standards of these products in different countries could end up with uh, countries not being able to monitor as they are willing. So how do you see the EU could play a role in adjusting this in future towards a healthier diet through uh, adjusted trades? Thank you. Thank you very much for the very good question. I think I'll split the answer into the three components. One component is, of course, regulation. Regulation and all free trade agreements that have been discussed between the Eurasian Economic Union and third states. Uh, the second, uh, of course, while, while we do that type of negotiations, as you know, the free trade agreement includes uh, most of the things that you've mentioned. But simultaneously, we also continue work in terms of the approximation and harmonization of our internal trade between member states, which usually includes the best international practices. And that's very important for us. Uh, recently, we have uh, signed a new agreement on circulation of seats, for example, which considers UPOV and other best international practices and also uh, regulatory documents. Uh, the second important thing I would say is the, uh, is the visibility of our work and also popularizing, say, all the tendencies that have been happening all around the world. That could be the policies targeted on the reduction of food waste and food waste management in general. It could be policies that stimulating the production of the plant-based proteins, for example, and we have a couple of very good examples on that. And other policies that uh, would promote not only nutrition, but also a better and healthier lifestyle for the, uh, for the people and uh, of the members of the Eurasian Economic Union. And the third set of the policies is of course uh, projects that we've been designing and the projects that would target sustainability, as I said, inclusiveness, and finally, also technologies. Some of my colleagues have mentioned technologies, and I think today we have a great opportunity in terms of the introduction of those technologies that would contribute to the green agenda. It could be, for example, the precision agriculture technologies that help us to better use the chemicals and the fertilizer in general, optimize the use of the inputs at the farm level. It could be the policies that promotes, as I said, plant-based protein development or food waste management technologies and many others. So to summarize, I would say we are continuing to the harmonization and approximation process in terms of the taking into account the best international practices. We're continuing our free trade negotiations with the third member states, which again includes all the issues that you've mentioned in terms of the closed border uh, control and other issues and finally, of course, it's in projects 
that I would say target more on the formation of the ecosystem that would help us to address the challenges of implementation of the digital and sustainable agenda in the member states. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hartunian. That has been an excellent and thorough response and definitely this to be continued later on bilaterally. Um, I have a last question from my end, actually. Connie will continue to Dr. Nazarov from Turkmenistan. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Nazarov, Turkmenistan has just taken over the chairmanship of the Secretariat for Regional Nutrition Partnership Platform in Central Asia and Caucasus. We also heard from Jessica that holistic food systems must be in societal dance with other multiple sectors like agriculture, health, social protection, education, et cetera. You're coming from the health sector. So I want to ask you if you could bring some examples where regional nutrition partnership platform could bring multi-sectors around health to respond to some of the nutrition concerns in the region and what measures you think further it need, needs to be taken by the health sector through the RMPP in a region to improve the nutritional situation of the most vulnerable groups. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Nazar. Thank you. As you said, first of all, we are happy to say that the Turkmenistan has taken the role of the president of the regional platform partnership in the area of nutrition два года, это 2021 и 2022 годы. Ну, для тех, кто э, может не знать, что такое региональная, региональная платформа, позвольте мне дать вам несколько предысторий. Так, в июле 2018 года э, многосекторальные делегации из Армении, Азербайджана, Грузии, Казахстана, Кыргызстана, Таджикистана, Туркменистана и Азбекистана а также партнеров по развитию ВНСФ, ВОЗ, ФАО и УПО собрались в Ашхабаде и согласовались, что в ответ на многочисленные бремени питания среди наиболее уязвимых групп населения Центральной Азии и на Кавказе им необходимо было создать механизм регионального партнерства в области питания, возглавляемый ими государствами членами. Этот механизм направлен на укрепление потенциально структурных элементов системы питания и управления в субрегионе. На данный момент платформе удалось мобилизовать различные соответствующие системы и секторы субрегионы, которые считаются ответственными за результаты в области питания. Это такие секторы являются продукты питания, здравоохранение, образование, социальная политика, водоснабжение, санитария. И даже мы принимаем активное участие в законодательстве в этом стремлении. Например, в результате многострановой пропагандной политики в области питания несколько стран региона уже разработали национальную политику и многоотраслевые стратегические планы в области питания. Или несколько стран в регионе сумели внедрить успешные национальные крупномасштабные программы по обогащению пищевых продуктов, такие как обогащение муки и ядированной соли. И, конечно же, в этой области ведутся и успешные, эффективные мероприятия, продолжаются и ведутся научные также исследования и образовательные такие работы широкого масштаба. Thank you very much, Dr. Nazarov, for your uh, succinct response to this, and I give it back to you, Connie. And uh, I see now I've been muted, so um, uh, thank you very much. And I'd actually like to bring in somebody towards the end uh, who's been listening the whole time. And uh, she and her age group are the ones driving the process. They are actually of the youth community uh, of the UN uh, FSS uh, Summit. And uh, Sophie Hiritho, uh, youth ambassador from Ireland, speaking for everybody around the globe. So what kind of 
vision do you actually have how we produce and consume food uh having listened to everything uh, that you've just had in the last uh, 35 minutes what's your take yeah so today over 1.1 billion people are under the age of 30 so that's over half of the world's populations and we need a voice at the table for not just for now to make decisions but for our future and i have the pleasure of co-chairing the youth liaison group for the un food system summit and that's made up of over 150 activists and agriculturalists from around the globe that are, are all under the age of 30 and we are there to help hold the summit accountable to what it promises to do but also to ensure that young people are integrated into the summit decision making structure and program and what's really beautiful about the un food system summit is that it has allowed us to have this space to also connect with other youth initiated organizations and campaigns like the World Food Forum, which the Director General of the FAO has already mentioned. But it has also led for youth campaigns to come out of this process, such as the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign, which is a youth global promise to galvanize action to transform food systems. But we cannot do this alone. This is not only our responsibility, but the responsibility of governmental agencies and businesses. And why businesses? Because I said 1.1 billion young people are across the globe. That's 1.1 billion consumers. And it is profitable for businesses to have us on their side. Young people wanting access to safe, nutritious and affordable food. But as Fatima and Medina mentioned, access means nothing without education. So this is the responsibility of everyone. And we hope that everybody here can work with us to ensure that a healthy diet does not remain a luxury for future generations. Thank you so much. And definitely your voice was heard. And uh, with that, I thank you. And I thank you all the panelists that have uh, given voice uh, to the program, to their engagement, uh, whether it's on a macro level or uh, on the ground, uh, how to change uh, the system and how to bring in those that are less privileged uh, at the moment. Thank you very much, Amir. Pleasure to co-moderate. And now, ladies and gentlemen, on the way to panel two, let's have a look at one aspect of innovation and it uh, may strike you as uh, weird that looking back can be innovation because some of the technologies that we're looking at are CRISPR uh, technologies, for example, gene editing, agroengineering, but there are other pathways and that are, for example, to actually remember the heritage of our food plants and we're going to have a look at what they do in Georgia. Kartuli Horbli Sambavi. Bravali Kulturul in Cenaris. Matshoris Horbli Sarmoshobis Kera, Sinazia. Sakartologi Amkeris, Nishnolovani Nazili. Da Horblis, Erterti Samshoblova. Soplioshi Gavcele Buli Horblis, Otsam de Saheobidan. Sakartologi Trutmeti Mohaudat. Da Matshoris Huti. Ratsimas Nishnausrom, Esaheo Baby Sakartolos Garet Swagan, Arsat Kuteba. Biologiur meurneobata asociacija Elkana, kartuli ara samtavrobo organizacija. Romelicukwe otsta samic elia, ara marto kartuli horblis konservacija sada popularizacija sudskop schels. Ara met stilops, am sakmiano baši radšej izleba met i entuziast i per meričartos. Dres dreobi čeli ba itko sorci itel dolc ara peri aga remukreba. Magram aj, danar čen sahe obev, sčirdeba nam vilat mihedua, ahtgena, და გამრავლება და პოპულარიზაცია. საინტერესოა რომ ადგილობრივ ხორბალსა და მისგან გამომცხვარ პურზე მოთხოვნა მზარდია, როგორც ადგილობრივ, ისე საექსპორტო ბაზრებზე. ამან სტიმული მისცა მწარმოებლებსაც. ხოლო ორი წელია რომ შემოსავლის მნიშვნელოვანი წყაროა. ჩვენთვის თორე მანამდე არა. მანამდე უბრალოდ ჩვენი თვის აი ტრადიციების გამო უფრო ძირითადად თან კარგი გემრიელი პური გამოდის და მაგის გამო ინარჩუნებდით. ელი როგოზა Amerikali ekspertia. Massachusettsi, tavisi ve mitaze mohaus xorbali. Atxob spurs da qidis. Ramdeni metzlis tsin kartuli xorblit da interesda. Da elkanas dakhmarebit kartul saxeobebs iklevs. 
It's been my research over many years that the Georgian wheats are elite, superior, disease resistant, best flavor and gluten safe, meaning that they're real food growing from the earth. Tumtsa mi uxedavat metsnierebisa da entuziasti permerebis zalismevisa. Kartuli endemuri khorblis umetesoba dges faktobrivat agariteseba da mati dakargvis saptxe realuria. Ase rom kitkhva sheudzlebt tu ara kartuli khorblis shenarchunebas ჯერ კიდევ პასუხ გაუცემელი რჩება. ქართული ხო and with that uh, we are uh, into the second panel just one quick remark it's quite amazing that sort of old variations uh, cut out food intolerances for example cut by, caused by gluten and uh, we also know that that is part and parcel of our health uh, that is connected to our food we're going to talk more about uh, the big picture about nature positive and climate resilient food production we're talking about greener outcomes and the financing of it and uh, i believe uh, the director general said it was round about a third um, that uh, greenhouse gas emissions today are associated with the agricultural production chain and network uh, some of the figures uh, put it as low as 18 percent but whatever it's a big percentage so it is worthwhile looking at it so uh, i'm uh, not uh, going to be alone. I have Maxim Fergajic uh, of UNDP as my uh, co-moderator for this session. Maxim, uh, normally based in Istanbul and uh, from UNDP, so the absolute specialist. Thank you for being with me and I'd now like to very briefly introduce uh, our panel. Um, His uh, Eminence Jamshid Kodyaev, the Minister for Agriculture of the Republic of Uzbekistan who is a driving force for both the process leading to uh, the UN Food System Summit and uh, you also hosted the FAO conference last no uh, November in Uzbekistan. We say hello to Elena Matejsku, uh, the Director General of the Romania Meteorological Administration, Vice Chair of the WMO Standing Committee on Services for Agriculture. We say hello to Dua Abdel Motal uh, and and uh, she has here the title Senior Counselor of the World Trade Organization, but there's hardly any organization around the planet, climate change, agriculture, international trade that you have not worked for. So um, with an eagle's view, so to say. And last but not least, we have talked about the industry. We have the industry here, Volkert Engelsmann for the private sector, you are CEO of Eorstar, an international distributor of organic and fair fruits and vegetables come based in the Netherlands but of course trading a long way around and um, ladies and gentlemen we are a little bit late in time so maybe we tighten our answers uh, just as much as we tighten our questions and Maxime is going to start. Thank you, thank you Connie, thank you colleagues, uh, great to see you, great to be co-moderating this session. We've just uh, saw a quick movie from Georgia uh, which is about uh, the environmental aspects of productivity. And clearly at the end, we heard the message that it's critical to have collaboration between government, farmers, and the research. My first question, um, Mr. Minister, will be to you. Um, if we take Uzbekistan, um, what uh, concrete policies, maybe financial incentives, is, is Uzbekistan putting in place has put in place already or is planning to put in place so that this transition to more sustainable from the biodiversity perspective from climate perspective transition to more sustainable agriculture could actually become reality Looks like 
the picture is frozen i'm not quite sure maybe uh at this point uh we skip uh this uh question i think the question has arrived uh, and we'll bring in uh the minister as soon uh, as he is back online uh and uh, in that case i'd like to turn uh, to Dua. um uh, one of the can, you, can, you, can you hear me oh no we can yes yes okay <laughs> thank you thank you So apparently we're having some technical right. issues. Maybe maybe we we try and suss out uh, the technical issue. Maybe they can sort of redial in. And ladies and gentlemen, you're all used to this happening once upon a time in a conference. Uh, Dua, um, uh, one of the leading thinkers in Switzerland has recently titled his thought for a food conference, what's the point of having healthy people on a sick planet um, and uh, the the question uh, that's leading back to the WTO is what's the role of trade policy for both having a healthy planet and healthy people thank you very much uh, for this question Connie and thank you very much for this invitation to this conference um, what is the role of trade in ensuring that the planet is healthy well trade is a connector right? Trade is what allows products to move from one country to another. It's what allows food, what allows food to move from one country to another. It's what allows people to move from one country to another. So it allows we eat to move and it allows those who produce what we eat to move. It led to the creation of global agricultural value chains. So in the context of food, I think the international trading system has an incredibly important role to play in ensuring food security, number one. Then when you, uh, you know, countries, there are, there are at least uh, 30 to 40 countries around the world who import the vast majority of their food. Without those imports, they would starve. So trade and food security are, or key. Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing to keep in mind. Then when you consider the fact that food is water, food is energy, food is land, then it becomes immediately clear that trade in food is trade in natural resources. Uh, it's a more efficient allocation of natural resources. And I always like to take my own country, Egypt, as an example, being Egyptian. Um, the, U the UNDP has told us that were Egypt to try to grow all of its food and to attempt to be self-sufficient, it would need three river Niles, not one. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about the role of trade in promoting a healthier planet and a more efficient allocation of natural resources. I'll stop here. And yes, I just wanted to specify uh, what I wanted to get at. And thank you very much for laying that basis, because that is why, like uh, international trade agreements, as we've heard earlier, as we've heard from the EEC as well, you know, what they're doing on a macro level, WTO. So uh, would you consider, I mean, you're an advisor, but uh, would you consider that uh, WTO's policies and, and frameworks are pro naturally based agriculture and therefore uh, the trade, i.e. like for example in the EU there's this uh, discussion on uh, deforestation free supply chains that we want to institute even. So how does that mirror, how is that mirrored uh, at the WTO? Um, so the WTO is a trade organization, it doesn't have that environmental standard. The, uh, the environmental standards that government set at the national, regional, international level uh, are standards that, that they are free to choose. The important thing that we look for in the WTO rulebook is policy space. What we try to ensure and what our negotiators have tried to ensure is that all countries have the space under WTO law to create the standards that are needed, environmental, social, um, consumer information standards that they require. So, um, so in that sense, this is, uh, you know, the WTO has come a long way um, in creating that policy space. It recommends also that, gover that governments base themselves on international standards uh, because internationally negotiated standards have more acceptability or easier to use than a variety of different and conflicting national and regional 
standards. Um, now, you mentioned deforestation. This is, uh, you know, a, a very good example. Um, countries are completely free under WTO rules to set the standards they, they the environmental standards they want to protect their forests. Um, when it comes to traded products and how those standards reflect on internationally traded products, there, there's a series of rules that they might that they must comply with in setting those standards. The standards must truly be aimed at environmental protection and not be a disguised restriction on trade, etc. Thank you so much. And uh, we're just going to try and see uh, whether uh, Mr. Kodyaev is back. Maxim, and maybe you... uh, he's certainly grinning, so he might be. Yes. <laughs> um... Yes, uh, indeed, it, it, it's good to see Mr. Minister back. So, um, shall I rephrase my question, or, or Mr. Minister, was was that question clear to you? Just indicate. Well, it, it was clear to me. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, Great. It, it is not necessary. To be honest, uh, we are um, already for two years uh, experiencing really uh, a good change in um, institutional change in the policy change. And uh, it is a good change for uh, our farmers in terms of the implementing the innovation, the water saving system, and of course the uh, the greening uh, innovation systems as well. So uh, that was because of we adopted the new agriculture development strategy for the 2020 and 2030, and we worked very closely with our. Uh, partners from World Bank, EU, and FAO. So uh, to give you some practical examples, um, we developed a new promotion for organic farming and good agriculture practices. And our main focus is currently on defining the specific standards for organic production and certification in line with the internationally recognized practices. And according to uh, to our new program. Uh, in this year, we are going to introduce around 200,000 hectares for organic farming. And that, that would be a three year program, um, which starts from this year. And uh, they are uh, upscaling the introduction of the good agricultural practices uh, and certification system for 500,000 hectares. Uh, I think. And we have uh, quite a number of the comprehensive incentives uh, for the producers. And in addition, uh, starting from this year again, uh, we launched educational program for bachelor's and master's students to allocate uh, 120 uh, scholarships annually for organic production system specialists. Uh, and it is very significant efforts uh, of the government to achieve a sustainable agriculture practices in line with uh, SDGs. And in February this year, we committed to establish and develop a new integrated agriculture knowledge and innovation systems, uh, as everyone knows, ACIS, to create a sustainable mechanism for farmers and producers in order to access the necessary knowledge and services at all levels. And of course, we have uh, this year, we made a very big jump on the water saving system. And we introduced uh, almost 200,000 hectares with, uh, and we applied the water saving system there. It is almost like um, 10 times more than the last year because of the, uh, not only uh, the scarcity of the water, but uh, we believe this is the only way how we can actually make our agriculture more sustainable. And of course, uh, uh, we have uh, many, many uh, pilot incentive programs which are aimed to promote the uptake of new technologies uh, and of course the uh, water saving technologies, smart cultivation and harvesting technology and investment in targeted sorting, grading, storage, and processing technologies. And um, it, it's just a, a, a very brief introduction. I don't want to take um, um, much time of yours uh, on introducing our uh, new system. So 
uh, as a final, as a chairperson, as a chairperson of the FAO ERC, I strongly uh, encourage all our countries in the region um, and development partners to uh, mobilize our efforts to work together towards to the Global Food System Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. This is amazing input. Uh, we've heard very concrete things that you're doing as a, you know, as a government, I think it's because this session is going to be recorded. This is empty, empty uh, space for learning from you, for others to get in touch with you and learn. Uh, on this panel, uh, we have uh, a voice, which is actually a person uh, who is who's running a, a sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, fruit company, uh, Fol uh, Volker Engelsmann. And I would like to ask a question now that we've heard uh, what uh, the government is, is, of Uzbekistan is doing to promote from the other side, from the side of farmers, those who work with these things. In your experience, um, commercial, representing commercial sector, essentially, is there, is there now time to talk about sustainability becoming a new norm? It, it, it just like recognize that the production as such which is continuing to harm environment and climate is probably not going to survive, not just because of environment and climate, but also for, 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 from the profitability point of view. What, what is your experience? How do you make nature part of your value chains? And uh, do you really make it profitable? Thank you for asking, Maxime, and uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, my a big compliment for the minister from Uzbekistan for his vision and his commitment to sustainability and particularly organic farming, which uh, we believe is the future. Um, whilst not the only way to sustain farming principles, by far, so far, the best system on the planet from a legislation and certification point of view. Um, the market is um, fed up with uh, farming that pollutes the environment and is embracing fully organic and sustainable food that looks after soil fertility, clean water, biodiversity, and mitigation of climate change. To begin with, the market is fully embracing um, healthy food uh, without pesticides and mineral fertilizers or genetic engineering. And finally, the market is totally prepared to pay a premium for that. After all, health uh, is not a matter of pills, but peppers, so to speak. It's not end of pipe uh, solutions that count, it's beginning of pipe healthy food uh, that counts as the best way to more health and social inclusion and healthy ecosystems in the first place. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, if, we, if we're all good, then we can actually come uh, around uh, back to you, Volkert, uh, in a moment. Uh, I'd now like to address Elena. Elena, uh, um, who is also uh, not just uh, working for the WMO, but also the uh, part of the Standing Committee on Services for Agriculture. And we've already heard um, that uh, academia, that the advice of scientists has had in the last couple of years, and certainly since COVID-19, a much much higher standing that people are actually listening to what you say. Now, the question is, what are they listening to? Uh, you have a bunch of advice. Uh, you have a bunch of um, systems thinking and uh, ideas of how to improve uh, the climate change issues and the weather related crisis. How do you transfer your knowledge to the farmers, to the decision makers? Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you to all uh, for the, to be part on this event uh, and see you all uh, again. Uh, our experience as uh, scientists must be correlated in the context of climate change, how we could develop uh, the best infrastructure in terms of meteorology and agrometeorology domain to observe, monitor, and forecast extreme events, because it will be, will be very important if we could connect such a kind of information and, da and data with adaptation measure to climate change for agriculture and food system, we could find the most appropriate measure to reduce climate change impact on, uh, on the extreme phenomena on our lives. 
how we could transfer from the research to innovation to practitioner will be very important in the future. As scientists, I um, support very uh, strongly the Horizon Europe program because this program is dedicated to research and innovation, in particular to food, bioeconomy, natural resource, agriculture, fishery, aquaculture, and environmental pro uh, project. In this way, uh, all institutions that uh, have research uh, as uh, the main expertise and domain, including meteorological services, could apply and to input share experiences uh, by now, uh, sharing the best practices and sharing the information on agricultural uh, climate change impact and losses. In this way, we could share information to find and to offer uh, the best scientific information to the uh, decision makers, to the politicians, because without uh, scientific information, we cannot find the most appropriate adaptation measure at national, regional, or international uh, level. In this way, regional and international cooperation on food research and innovation, with particular reference, I told you already, to climate change adaptation and mitigation, agroecology, sustainable land management, or sustainable uh, use of biodiversity, resilience, and risk assessment, must become the far, first priority on the decision maker agenda. In this way, we uh, offer information and uh, Horizon Europe and its EU uh, key funding program for research and innovation with a budget of 10 uh, billion uh, euro. We need to correlate also the EU uh, Green Deal on the biodiversity strategy it's one of the best strategy uh, in present correlate with the uh, farm to fork strategy because common agriculture policy framework offer also uh, dedicated uh, framework for this domain to find and to reduce the impact on uh, climate change. I uh, want to uh, emphasize the um, uh, work or uh, say by France uh, Timmerman, Timmermans, when the EU Green Deal on biodiversity was approved, climate change and biodiversity laws as are a clear and present danger to humanity. At the heart of the Green Deal, the biodiversity and farm to fork strategy point to a new and better balance of nature, food system and biodiversity to protect our people's health and well-being and at the same time to increase the EU competitiveness and resilience. These strategies are a crucial part of the great transition we are embarking upon. Lovely, Elena. Thank you very much. And maybe we'll come back to Orient Gate uh, later. And uh, just uh, to let everybody else know, originally we had planned to have uh, a, a EU representative. Uh, today, however, is a big day. Uh, the EU Parliament uh, is discussing with the Commission uh, on uh, the uh, new um, way that the common agricultural policy is going to go. And of course, uh, with those discussions going on, uh, we lost our EBU representative. Over to Maxime. Maxime, are you with me? Uh, unmute yourself. Unmute? Indeed. Yeah, I'm sorry. Technical difficulties on my side. Um, yeah, I would like to say that we, yeah, we, we just heard that the, indeed the European Union has one of the most advanced systems of supporting farmers through incentives. Um, and these uh, incentives or subsidies, so to say, uh, that, that, is, that is actually one of the um, buzzwords these days with respect to transfer, transition towards greener economy and greener agriculture, amongst others. Uh, we have on, on our panel... Um, Mr. Namik Shalbuzu from uh, the Agrarian Research Center. The, the, this is the Ministry of Agriculture in Azerbaijan, his deputy chair. And uh, I would like to ask him, uh, 
we certainly know what EU is doing on subsidies, but if we take a country which is slightly different, let's put it this way, context of Uzbek, uh, uh, sorry, Azerbaijan, what is what in your opinion is is possible to do uh, in a country such as Azerbaijan? Or maybe you again, you can give us examples of what your country has been doing or is planning to do with, res with respect to subsidies and how these subsidies can become actually instrument of transition towards green agriculture. Uh, thank you, dear uh, Maxim, dear friends, gentlemen, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, warmest greetings from Azerbaijan to all of you. Okay, how subsidies can be a tool to help farmers to, for adoption technologies, uh, actually environmentally friendly technologies, and to save land and water. In Azerbaijan, you know, uh, agriculture is one of the most important sectors of, uh, of the economy, and uh, state is supporting this sector by all means. And of course, one of the mechanisms to support agriculture is the current subsidy system. So in Azerbaijan, the subsidy system is actually maximally designed in such a way that it promotes farmers to adopt technologies that protect soil and provide efficient use of water resources. So I will bring you some examples. First of all, subsidy system, in Azerbaijan stimulates agrochemical analysis of soil. What it means? It means each uh, producer of seeds and seedlings and agricultural, other agricultural producers with soil area more than 10 hectares, they have to apply agrochemical analysis of the soil. If they do not apply this, uh, analysis, they cannot get the subsidy. They are not paid the subsidy. So this in some kind stimulates the producers make this analysis of the soil. Second, subsidies are paid, taking into account the characteristics of economic regions, natural and climatic conditions, which means in Azerbaijan, the subsidies are stimulating the production of agricultural products well, in a principle, right crop in right place. So it means the agricultural development with a harmony, in the harmony with the nature, let's say so. Also, starting from 2021, a one-time investment subsidy is paid for intensive orchards in Azerbaijan. And an orchard to be assumed as an intensive orchard, one of the conditions uh, is that dripping irrigation systems or other modern irrigation systems should be in that, uh, applied in that orchard. Only after that, they can get these investment subsidies. And by the way, the amount of this investment subsidies is varies around 200 manats and to 11 thousand months. So it's a considerable amount of money. And also in Azerbaijan, the agriculture, uh, agricultural producers, let's say so, it is highly fragmented. <clears throat> because we have lots of two, uh, farmers with two or three hectares, even less. So in Azerbaijan, cooperatives get subsidies with uh, extra 10% of current subsidy amount if this is a cooperative. So it also stimulates the producers come together. Manik, this guy, yes? Can you come to a close? We're, we're sort of a bit pressed for time, sorry. <laughs> okay, also, you know, we have other, with the subsidies actually it is all, but we have other also uh, strategies, mechanisms to which promote application of modern technologies and of modern uh, irrigation systems. Uh, one of them is 40% discount is applied for purchase of agricultural techniques and irrigation systems through, from state budget. Yes, also uh, irrigation facilities, if Mami. they are, yes? <laughs> 
uh, it, it, we, we highly appreciate that you have probably uh, 10 more examples and that's absolutely fascinating. Um, um, alas, uh, we are running a little bit over time and uh, um, I, we congratulate you on uh, walking down that pathway and hope that you keep up the energy of implementing uh, those positive uh, um, uh, policies and of course financial incentives. And with that, I'd like to uh, switch over to Dua. Uh, Again, um, we have these discussions and we've seen uh, just now the example of how it can be made on a, let's say, on a concrete uh, uh, regional and uh, national level. Now, we have the uh, questions of the loss of biodiversity, infertile souls, climate crisis, fallouts, and of course, they have to be priced in. That's sort of the modern way of talking and thinking. How does that reflect in an organization like the WTO, which of course you always say is about trade, but it must have sort of a resonance there? Uh, okay, well, um, uh, as I mentioned before, um, the WTO creates policy space for governments to pursue to uh, their environmental objectives. Um, and that policy space is very wide. In fact, um, you know, first of all, the agreements provide for that policy space. Uh, governments are allowed to set product standards. The only thing we say with respect to product standards is that they must not be disguised restrictions on trade. They must truly have an environmental objective and they must be, the standards must be um, uh, uh, prepared in such a way um, uh, that they do not represent unnecessary obstacles to trade. So the standards themselves must be relatively straightforward and not an impediment to trade, even when the objective is a good one. Um, otherwise, WTO rules in the field of agriculture allow countries to use subsidies to pursue environmental goals. There is a green box of allowable subsidies in the WTO rule book. Um, the EU common agricultural policy evolve in the direction of expanding its use of WTO permissible subsidies and reducing its use of trade distorting subsidies. But we also have environmental negotiations taking place in the WTO on a variety of different subjects. I, I don't know if you would like me, Connie, to comment on those now or in your next question. I'm not quite sure whether there's going to be a next question. So if you can sort of, you know, uh, pinpoint uh, two things and then um, we'd be very happy if you could do that. Of course, with pleasure. So um, in the WTO, we have um, environmental discussions that are also taking place. One of the most important environmental negotiations taking place in the WTO has to do with fisheries subsidies. And I, I would love for this region to take note of those negotiations and to support them because we really hope, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, as you can see, uh, we really hope to bring those negotiations to a conclusion very, very soon. Uh, now, the fishery subsidies negotiations are intended to reduce the environmentally harmful fishery subsidies that are depleting our oceans, uh, that are uh, driving too many boats to chase after too few fish. So I really hope that governments will support those negotiations. But we also have other discussions, environmental discussions taking place in the WTO on climate change, how to address climate change, how to reduce our use of plastics, and so on. So this is just just a flavor, Connie. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, so nice of you. And uh, I'll hand over to Maxime. Indeed, this is great to hear. I'm very much enjoying this discussion, like the point uh, that um, had been made about the environmental discussions happening at the international level, and like the point that was made by Azerbaijan about the right crop in the right place, which I think uh, is pretty much about the sustainability to do things right at the right time in the right place in the long-term perspective. Now, turning to Again, to the Minister of Agriculture of Uzbekistan, uh, we've just heard uh, uh, some of them mentioning that, you know, organic is about biodiversity more than anything else. However, we've also had discussions happening about climate. Climate is, is big on the agenda. Mitigating uh, emissions is, is, is one of the key things on the international and national policies. Um, with respect to Uzbekistan agricultural sector and its connection to emissions, Maybe you can just give us a couple of examples of this also thinking that the government is having with respect to how reduce the impact of agriculture on emissions. 
Thank you, Maxim. Uh, I will continue on behalf of Mr. Khadjaev because of his commitment for another important meeting. Just he left and I will continue. So my name is Alicia Shukurov. I am the senior advisor to the minister. Uh, as our minister mentioned, we have a significant commitment on introduction of the uh, organic, more green technologies and the practices in the agri-food sector. This is very much linked with the climate change. So, and speaking about our region in Central Asia, we have uh, already uh, the, the, the impact of the climate change is visible, which is the land degradation, which is the soil erosion. More than 50% of the soil is the highly salinated. Can you imagine? This is the really warning situation. And also biodiversity loss. So I can list many, many challenges. And speaking about the agriculture sector, we are, first of all, really vulnerable to the climate change. And secondly, agri-food sector, land use and land use change sector is the contributor to the climate change. So we should think about the both. In this respect, as our minister mentioned, we have also significant commitment in this respect. And based on the agri-food strategy, which, uh, 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 which we have introduced, until 2025, we have a commitment 30% of decreasing the greenhouse gas emissions. And until 2030, 50% decreasing the greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, this is really significant. This is the challenging, but we need to work on this. We have a, a very big ambitious plan and we need to work on this. And today we have launched the national assessment of the climate change impact to the agriculture sector together with EU and World Bank and FAO. So this year will be more precise activities will be, um, will be defined and starting uh, uh, next year will be introduced to the practice. So we would like to work in this and we have plans and we have partners. So uh, I believe in the coming year, we will have more tangible results in this respect. Sounds great. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'd like to come back to Elena. Um, you have uh, in the last uh, intervention sort of pointed out how the research is being conducted. And uh, what would you say from your research? What strategies would you advise both uh, politicians, policymakers, but also farmers uh, to cope with the climate variability and the change for agriculture, forests and fisheries. Yes, it will be very important, the uh, last technique and technology that we need to develop to offer the best information for the decision maker and policy. Uh, climate change in our domain impact on agriculture rely uh, on the modeling of uh, long-term observation and agroclimatic data in order to establish risk assessment and to highlight the area with high vulnerability to extreme uh, climate events. For this reason, the data on climate change, crop production and water demand indices must be integrated in a GSI platform in order to identify area with high vulnerability to water scarcity and drought, for example. Also, the use of uh, information and communication technology, ICT technology in agriculture, uh, based on uh, soil sensor, the use of drones, wireless remote and control irrigation system, data collection, processing and information system to support decision makers are very important and are very best decision for our activity. Uh, for example, an uh, innovative remote and ground, uh, ground sensor data and tools into a decision support system for agriculture water management in our country as a pilot study for a very droughty area in southern eastern part of our country offer uh, very good information uh, and deliver recommendation for on-farm uh, irrigation scheduling. This is the best connection between research and practitioners in uh, our field. Also, will be very important the role of uh, transfer of uh, knowledge and professional training uh, in the development of the domain. In this context, I would like to mention the Common initia Initiative 
of the WMO, uh, FAO, EUMETSAT, and Meteo Romania, because uh, we organized in last uh, year, in uh, starting from November to December 2020, uh, 2020 uh, the virtual training course on the use of satellite product on drought monitoring and application in agrometeorology. In this way, experts from the Ministry of Agriculture and National Meteorological and Hydrological Services participate in these three weeks in a virtual training course, and we find the uh, best possibility to share information and to find a new technology as one of the main uh, priority to use in decision uh, climate change and adaptation uh, me measure. Finally, I want to mention that only the linkage between scientific community and practitioner in agriculture and food production must be correlated with the need to put in practice the scientific climate knowledge. Elena, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll hand over to Maxim and Falkert. Thank you. That's very interesting, uh, very interesting inputs. Um, let me ask, uh, indeed, Falkert, you've heard decision makers from different countries, you've heard on technologies. What is your message, so to say, to decision makers, to policy makers from the ground, from those who are working, you know, in, in the in, in the in the fruit, fruit sector? Well, thanks for asking, Maxime. I think the most important thing to achieve is a level playing field in the market where the polluter no longer gets away with a competitive advantage. This is precisely what's happening now. So we can talk endlessly about mitigating climate change. To cut it short, we can talk about people and planet, but if we don't address the profit definition that allows externalization of costs to future generations, it will be like uh, mopping up the floor with the tap open. <laughs> so with all respect for the WTO who um, speak about uh, subsidies and fisheries, etc., I think it would be a tremendous opportunity for the WTO to contribute to a more um, uh, level playing field in which also um, costs that are presently being externalized are implemented in today's uh, short-term profit definition. Um, it all starts with transparency uh, sustainability should be measured, managed, marketed, but also uh, be monetized. And there are plenty examples of monetization exercises uh, that put a price on the damage done to people and planet. If we don't address that long-term profitability of society at large, then we can for forget about profitability in general. So my appeal to policymakers uh, would be, please help to create a more level playing field by means of implementing regulations, uh, targets, uh, threshold values, but also by creating a more level playing field by um, uh, exercising uh, fiscal incentives that, that, that prevent that costs of damage to soil, water, biodiversity, and climate uh, change will be externalized to future generations. Over to you, Connie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Falkert. And you know, we could listen to you and to each and every one of you on the panel a bit longer, unless we have one common enemy, that's time. Um, I would like to say thank you, not just to Maxime uh, for the great questions, but also to each and every one of you, uh, Yamshit, Elena, Doa and uh, Falkert for your contributions. I'm quite sure there will be some questions afterwards and we know that the uh, Q&A section has been played quite a bit. Uh, for everybody who is still on the line, we're going to take another seven minutes and uh, then uh, we are really finished. Uh, so forgive us that we are overrunning a bit, but we have sent such fantastic messages. Again, thank you.
Talking about uh, messages, um, there are some people who sort of take initiative into their own hands, as we have seen before, like uh, NGOs on the ground. And uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, initiative that we do not want you not to see. And uh, uh, that's an initiative that is looking at the uh, food waste. Uh, everybody here is uh, probably aware we have 30% loss at the beginning of the production, uh, then we have 30% on the consumer side and you can actually save on that you can reduce that waste and uh, uh, Blase Yossi Fofsky is actually doing something like that with his NGO he is the president of let's do Macedonia and we're going to see what he does hello everyone from the Macedonian rice fields. My name is Blaz Josipovski. I'm coming from the NGO Let's Do It Macedonia. We are fighting food loss and waste uh, every single day. Uh, we have developed two programs that are focused on the marginalized groups in our food systems. On the one side are the farmers, uh, with, uh, for whom we have developed together with FAO a strategy uh, to fight food loss and waste in our country and develop policies that can attack all the issues that are uh, stopping us into making a sustainable uh, one. Uh, on the other hand, together with 30 NGOs in the country, we have developed a network that works through a web platform uh, that connects uh, food entities and NGOs that then help uh, the, the, the marginalized social groups. And through this web platform, we have saved thousands of uh, tons of uh, food every single year and helped a lot of people uh, with the most uh, uh, problem, the biggest problem in the country. Unfortunately, every fifth person in our country has problem to provide uh, uh, themselves uh, food, despite the fact that we are throwing so much, uh, so much food. Um, I wanna uh, speak about the problem with COVID because it has even emphasized how important it is to save the food in this kind of situations, because more and more people are in the poverty poverty line. Uh, that is why uh, the next session that you're going to have uh, to be motivated and help as much uh, as much as um, possible uh, the different stakeholders in the food uh, systems. Thank you. What a charming man and what a great initiative. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would just say uh, each and every one of you has heard all the messages. Now it's time to almost say goodbye. Uh, it's eight weeks to go to the 2021 Food Systems Pre-Summit hosted by the Italian government end of July. And now uh, with a brief summary and his outlook, once again, Vladimir Rachmanin, the FAO Assistant Director General and regional representative for Europe and Central Asia. Vladimir, your floor. Uh, thank you very much, Konya. And uh, thank you all very much for such uh, interesting and rich discussion. I learned uh, a lot personally. I was staying through the whole meeting and uh, do not regret it at all. It's not only because I'm a host. And I also understand that we tested your patience. We went over uh, a little bit of time, uh, but I still dare to take uh, another maybe four minutes of your time to share with you some messages and precisely 10 messages, which I want uh, you to bring with you and to reflect upon, not claiming to be exhaustive. First message, uh, we all agree that food systems is uh, using the old phrase, is the link by grasping which we can pull out the whole chain of food security and reaching sustainable goal two. Food system is the key. Second, we all agree that circular econ economy dealing with food waste and loss will help us a lot in promoting food security. Third, uh, we all agree that there is a strong connection and we need to use it for our benefit uh, between climate change, environment, and agriculture. Four, investments are very, very important for agriculture. And we need to create good, comfortable conditions for the people who are producing our food. Five, innovation. 
and what is important in all its forms, not only technological, but social, as was correctly mentioned by uh, colleagues speaking here. Six, inclusiveness. We need to be inclusive and we need to put particular emphasis on the views and contributions from youth and women. And I got the message that there are 1.1 billion young people on this planet, and I hope that they will influence the development of food systems. Seven, healthy diets and nutrition. It's the prosperity of our nations. If the people are healthy, they are smarter. It's the, also very important for all of us. And we need to pay special attention to work with the young people, not to forget something that we borrowed from our parents, how to eat and how to be healthy, to bring it to the next generation. Eight, at the national level, multi-sectoral approach, food systems is not only Ministry of Agriculture, it's all agencies working and it's trade as well, as we learned from uh, our WTO colleague. So the government should work together and find a way to promote it. But it's also to bring into the discussion, of course, private business, civil society and academia. Nine, our region, Europe and Central Asia is a beautiful region full of very important experiences. It's very advanced in agriculture and we need to challenge ourselves to contribute not only to food system summit, but to food system development and to share our knowledge and our best practices. 10 and final, summit, which we shall have in September is the beginning. It's not the end in itself, it's the beginning. And we should stay committed to build and to develop sustainable, sustainable food systems on a long-term basis. So we are just starting our work. So concluding on that, allow me to express my gratitude uh, to all for contributing to this discussion. For you to stay with us for excellent moderation of Amir and Maxim. And of course, uh, very skillful, comfortable, and polite guidance from Connie as usual. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all very much. And allow me just the final thing probably to say, because I have very dedicated, very good colleagues working with me. I am privileged to have them. And I want to mention them. It's Raymond Yele, Mary Kenny, Valeria Roca, just three of them who contributed a lot to this discussion. So let's say together, it's, it's a noble work which we are doing. It's, I'm really proud that I'm working for FAO and I have an opportunity to contribute to Food System Summit. Thank you all very much. Vladimir, such a pleasure to meet you again and to now sort of be together uh, uh, in the picture even. And before we sign off, I'd like to leave you two or three ideas. One, uh, we actually see a plethora of people and organizations that are actually chipping in, that are making progress. And I, for one, uh, see that progress is happening everywhere. Today was uh, certainly an example of that. The question is, is change happening fast enough for the health of people and planet? And that's, of course, up to us and others. Secondly, we have just launched a community-based platform on food systems in Europe and Asia uh, by the Issue-Based Coalition. And uh, that's, of course, in conjunction with the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, the website you can see it there. And uh, we have started this conversation or we have continued this conversation. You can share, connect and have your say exactly on this platform. And uh, it is uh, not moderated. It is definitely for everybody to have their say. And last, uh, before I actually say goodbye, uh, we would love to leave you with the voices of the young 
and uh, you remember that we had food for thought and that's going to be part and parcel of it. So for me, it's been a pleasure to moderate this session. Thank you to all of the eight member organizations behind the issue based coalition. FAO, WFP, um, WHO, WMO, UNICEF, UNDP, UNEC, IFAD, and um, I think the thank you was already expressed by Vladimir. So now we can just listen to the voices of the youth community. Hunger and malnutrition. Climate change. Unsafe. Food. Deforestation. Poverty. Soil erosion. Inequality. Human rights violations and abuses. Food systems adds to these problems. We are the future. The young generations. But our future is uncertain. Food. Environment. People. We are all connected. Our beautiful planet should nourish us. Food shouldn't kill us. Food doesn't have to cost. Yeah. Food can be a way to create, not to destroy, to learn and to honor and to protect our past and our future, to build mutual respect, fairness, understand, collaboration. We must act for food and act for change so we can have good food for all. We can pledge. We can act. We can change our world. Join the movement for better food systems.